uh, which will get data much better uh, than the data we currently have from WMAP. Uh, and uh, there are missions planned, at least, for other kinds of observatories also at the same location. Uh, but WMAP was the first. So here's the data that I love so much. Uh, this is the theoretical triumph that I bragged about in my preview. Uh, the red curve is the theoretical prediction. These black dots are the data. Uh, and what we're plotting is the spectrum of these ripples that we see in the cosmic background radiation, uh, the non-uniformities uh, in the temperature pattern. Uh, so what's being plotted is the intensity of those fluctuations uh, as a function of their wavelength. Uh, now in this case, wavelength is not measured in meters because you're not really seeing meters. What you're seeing is a pattern on the sky. Uh, so wavelength is measured in degrees. Uh, you see that a certain blip subtends five degrees, and that becomes a five degree contribution uh, to the uh, spectrum. Uh, but it's a well-defined process. Uh, on the graph here, long wavelengths are to the left. This is 180 degrees on the left, and short wavelengths are on the right, 0 0.2 degrees. Uh, and there's this complicated pattern of wiggles that is predicted by the theory. Uh, and the data agrees beautifully. Uh, it's a little hard to see, perhaps, the black dots that are on this first peak. But they're there, and they have very small error bars and agree beautifully with the, with the red line, which represents the theory of inflation with dark energy, which I'll be talking about in a minute or two. Um, so that's my eureka moment. Uh, marvelous agreement between the theory and uh, what we actually see. Uh, and furthermore, you can ask about what would other theories predict and we put a few on this graph. If the universe were an open universe, like people thought 12 years ago when the astronomers told me inflation couldn't possibly be right when, whenever I had dinner with them. Uh, so that's this small yellow curve, which doesn't agree at all. Uh, you could also imagine talking about inflation without dark energy. That produces this green curve, which doesn't fit at all. Uh, and uh, 10 years ago or so, the people, there were a number of people who also thought that the structure in the universe that we see could arise by something called cosmic strings, which I won't take time to explain, but I don't need to explain it anymore because it doesn't fit the data at all. So nobody thinks that structure forms by cosmic strings anymore. Uh, cosmic strings, by the way, might still exist. Uh, that, that's still an open question, but they do exist. They have to be at a low enough energy so that they don't affect the structure that we're seeing, which is obviously does not correspond uh, to the way these cosmic strings would, would work. Uh, and here's a newer curve with more data. Uh, this is really the most recent data that exists, the seven-year data from WMAP. And as you see, the data keeps getting better and better, and it continues to just beautifully fit the theoretical curve. It's, it's marvelous. And soon, in about a year or so, we'll have new data from this satellite called Planck, uh, which will be about five times as precise. Uh, and uh, we'll get to see whether or not it still agrees with the predictions of the theory. But so far, everything has worked out beautifully. OK, so um, let me now shift gears again, having tried to describe for you how inflation works and why it is that we think our universe underwent this process of inflation. Uh, now I want to shift gears uh, and talk about this dark energy multiverse issue, uh, which is really one of the most important uh, unsolved problems in cosmology. Um, and that will be the subject for the next half of my talk. Uh, so it all goes back to 1998, uh, when astronomers made an astounding uh, observation. Uh, they discovered that the universe uh, is not currently slowing down due to the influence of gravity. Uh, but in fact, for about the past five billion years or so, uh, the universe has actually been accelerating for the last five billion out of the approximately 14 billion year history of the observed universe. Um, so this was very strange. Um, one implication is that it really means that inflation, or something like inflation, is really happening today. We really are seeing repulsive gravity uh, in the universe today. Uh, and that means that the universe today has to be filled uh, with something like this repulsive gravity material that I was telling you about in the context of inflationary theory. And in particular, in the context of general relativity, uh, that means a material with a negative pressure. Um, but we don't need to worry about exactly what that means. But the important point is that we are seeing in the universe today the same basic phenomenon of repulsive gravity uh, that inflation itself depends upon. Uh, so that is really a confirmation that the, the physics here is correct. Uh, gravity really can act repulsively, and even does, uh, for the last five billion years. 
so it also means that this repulsive gravity material must fill space. Uh, and this repulsive gravity material that fills space is what we call the dark energy. Um, and the, the phrase dark energy suggests uh, correctly that we don't know exactly what it is, uh, but we do know that there's something there uh, that's gravitationally repulsive that is causing the universe uh, to accelerate. Uh, now, what exactly is this dark energy? Well, um, I think there's at least one description that, that almost everybody working in this field would agree with, uh, which is, who knows? Um, that's as far as the agreement goes. Uh, but it's also fair to say that there's a simplest theory of what this dark energy might be, uh, and that's the one that I will talk about today. Uh, the simplest theory uh, is that the dark energy actually is just vacuum energy, uh, which is synonymous with the idea that Einstein introduced that he called the cosmological constant. Um, so what I mean is uh, assigning a non-zero, in this case positive, energy density to empty space itself. Uh, now you might think that empty space is obviously empty, so how could it have an energy density? And that's probably exactly what Einstein thought, so you have good company. Um, but from a modern point of view, it's actually not a problem uh, to think of the vacuum as having a non-zero energy, uh, because the vacuum is a very complicated state uh, from the point of view of particle physics. Um, there are fields, like the electric and magnetic field, that people are somewhat familiar with, uh, which if everything were described by classical physics, those fields would just be zero in the vacuum and would not have any energy. Uh, but because of quantum mechanics and the unpredictability of quantum mechanics, uh, those fields cannot be zero in the vacuum, and we do not think they are zero. They're constantly fluctuating because of the fundamental uncertainties associated with quantum theory, which we call quantum fluctuations. Uh, and those fluctuations have energies. Uh, there are negative contributions to the energies as well, uh, and the energy density of the vacuum really could be anything as far as particle physicists understand it. Uh, and we, we really don't know how to calculate it. Uh, so it's a mystery uh, what the energy density of the vacuum should be. Uh, and um, it seems quite plausible that the energy that we attribute to this dark energy, which is known because we know how much dark energy is needed to explain the acceleration that we see, uh, it's very possible that that is a, a real measurement uh, of the energy density of, of our vacuum. And that's what I'll be assuming. Uh, now I. Many physicists believe that this is one of the most important problems in, in cosmology today. Uh, and as an authority, uh, I will cite uh, a uh, decision that was made at the conference called Strings 2000, um, which was uh, you know, a conference at the turn of the millennium of uh, the world's uh, string theorists. Um, and at the end of the conference, they put together a list of the 10 most important uh, problems in physics for the next millennia. Uh, and uh, the list was chosen, you can magnify this, uh, the best 10 problems were selected uh, at the end of the conference by a panel that consisted of three experts, uh, Michael Duff from the University of Michigan, which was hosting this conference, uh, David Gross, Nobel Prize winner from the Institute for Theoretical Physics at Santa Barbara, uh, Edward Witten uh, from Caltech, and he's mainly at the Institute for Advanced Studies, uh, has not won the Nobel Prize, but is certainly one of the, the uh, foremost theoretical physicists in the world today. Uh, and they chose the, their 10 favorite problems. Uh, and uh, the problems are listed here. Um, note that the first problem was proposed by David Gross. Uh, and the second problem was proposed by Edward Witten. Uh, you can conclude from that what you want. Uh, but my conclusion is that Michael Duff is a very re reasonable and modest person. <laughs> But uh, one of the reasons I got this is this is the full list of 10. Notice number six, supplied by Andrew Chamblin of Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And I'll magnify that. Why does the cosmological constant uh, have the value that it has? Uh, this was back in 2000 when people weren't sure about these 1998 observations. Uh, is it zero or, and is it really constant? Uh, we're now pretty well convinced that it's not zero, uh, but we still don't understand it. Uh, what, Andrew said in 2000 about being one of the problems for the next millennia uh, remains to be true, and I'll, I'll try to explain why. Um, so even once we decide that this dark energy is vacuum energy, you might think the problem would be solved, uh, but in fact there's still a big problem. Uh, attributing dark energy 